time in the 40s, now the 40s and early 50s, uh, these rural towns were pretty grey places. I mean, there wasn't an awful lot going on. The cinema was, and though it's closed now, in our memories it's very special. We, we, we never called it the cinema. It was always the pictures. The film was a secondary, I think. It was just going to the movies was the first thing. That was the exciting thing. It was easily the most important building in the town. It was such a treat. The big screen, the Technicolor. It was like a new world. The pictures were an escape, I suppose, really, from the poverty that we had around the place. The comfort of that darkness, right? And, and you just get lost in this story. The cinema kind of encloses you. Uh, you're, you're completely taken into the space of the film. speaking to uh, next door neighbour people that live beside the cinema and I said, what is your recollection of the cinema? Well, he said, I remember when a big film would come and they'd run out of seats and they'd knock on our front door and he said, can we borrow your kitchen chairs? And of course, no health and safety at the time. They'd put the kitchen chairs down the aisle and everybody watched the, the film from that. There wasn't any popcorn, there wasn't any minerals, there wasn't any sweets, just as well, because we wouldn't have had the money for it anyway. We were lucky to get the four pence to go to the matinee on the Sunday. And uh, that would get you into the gods. <laughs> and the gods was made up of timber seating. And uh, the front of the, well, you were under the screen, really under the screen, like, you know. Of course, we were in the cheap seats out in the front, where the benches were. We called it the flea pit. We'd gather jam jars and things like that. Sell them to the local shopkeeper. Roughly, I think, uh, a half a penny and maybe 10 jam jars would be enough to get you into the matinee. But it was important. There wouldn't have been another cinema around. There was no, like, Clonakilty or Bantry. Both have cinemas now. They didn't exist then. We didn't have a car. There was no television. You had the radio, but really you're... you're your life revolved around your school and the church, except then on Sunday, the matinee on Sunday. Oh, how we look forward to Sunday evenings to go to the cinema, to have a bit of colour in our lives. You see, you have to understand, we didn't know there was another world out there. So this was bringing the other world to us. And it was a complete fantasy, because the world we lived in was raw reality. Normally I went with uh, my sister, Phil. Uh, we were, well, there's only two years between us, so... We'd be packed off together, and uh, it was a very safe, comfortable place. We didn't care what was on, but we'd all head up to the other end of the town from our house, pay our, our money, and in we'd go, and the noise would be horrendous because every child in the town would be there, and there'd be toffee papers flying around, and there'd be sweet munching, and they'd be tramping in and out to the toilets, and then the cinema would quieten down, and the picture would start and the owners of the cinema, uh, Barney and Sabina Dean. Who patrolled the cinema nightly and daily with a rod of iron and a flash lamp. And she'd shine the torch up and down the seats to see if there was any child misbehaving or any child doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And if they were, they were put out against the wall and made to stand outside, which was a terrible humiliation. And there might be hundreds of us in the front, down in the flea pit, Boys and girls, nothing untoward ever happened, except, of course, when the reel broke down, which it constantly did, and they'd be stamping a feet and booing, and a couple of the wise guys might try climbing over the back to get into the plush seats, but they were soon put out by the usher. We used to call him Connell. He was Mr O'Connell, long since dead, with his flesh lamp. And he'd catch them by the scruff of the neck and throw them out, but they'd come back in again the following Sunday. I remember it was a Sunday afternoon, and I was coming with my three brothers, 
And of course, they had girlfriends. They were a bit older than me and they didn't want me tagging along at all. And the next thing, they, I remember being in here and they said, there's visitors at home, Abby, you better go home. I left the cinema and went up home. There was no visitors. And when she went out, there was no back in because the door was closed. You know? As we got a bit older then, uh, we'd go with the friends, the, especially if we got into our, you know, 12, 13, about that age, we could actually go and pay enough to go on the balcony, which was about two pence dearer, I think. So I think I was almost 15 going, which is probably a laugh nowadays, like that, that was probably, maybe I went to something earlier, but the main thing I can remember getting excited to seeing was Back to the Future. Coming into the earlier teenage part of my life, I know that the cinema was a really big kind of social event. Um, on a Friday night, you'd end up there. It would be kind of between the ages of being too young to go anywhere by yourself, but not quite being old enough to go to the discos or anything like that. Especially at a younger age before going to a pub, it was like the place to go. It would be the talk is, it, oh, are you going to the cinema on Friday? I went with friends, so this was another big deal that uh, you were. I think there was an older sister as well somewhere, um, but they kind of sat in the row behind. So I felt like I was going with my friends. Um, so everybody would get dropped off to the cinema. We would never watch the film. <laughs> it was a great big social event. We'd take up the whole back rows of the cinema and it would just be a lot of crack and, and messing and mostly ending up with us getting kicked out. <laughs> but the memories of that stays with you because it was, for a moment, it was pure, for that hour and a half, it was pure joy. We looked forward to, to it, particularly in my case, if it was cowboys and Indians and plenty of gunshots, etc., etc. I mean, we, we were just wild about Westerns. Uh, the cowboys and the Indians, and you thought they hadn't a care in the world except they were battling with each other. Most of the films at those days seemed to be cowboys and Indians. And we had cowboy suits, and we wore Stetsons and revolvers, and you know, have shootouts and everything like that. I, that's mostly, it was mostly cowboy pictures we went to. We had a, man, a magic lantern at home, and uh, I can still see cowboys and Indians on the wallpaper, <laughs> tomahawks. <laughs> Along Cassidy's and Gabby Hayes and uh, uh, Kit Carson, uh, ones like that. In actual fact, one of my, my my abiding memories was in relation to the Kit Carsons, which were what we used to call follier uppers or cliffhangers. And if I remember, there was about ten or twelve series each Friday, and I was allowed to go to every one except the last one, where the climax was about to take place. And the reason for that, I think the main film must have the word love or passion or something like that in it. And I remember crying bitter tears uh, that, that I wasn't allowed to, uh, to go to the last one. Uh, the, the second movie of, uh, in a two-movie two uh, programme was often a Western, a B-Western, which were cheaply made Westerns. I remember, I remember seeing one I think Rory Calhoun or something like this must have been the star in it. But I remember looking at this and the two, the, the two guys were on their horses in the middle of nowhere talking to one another, you see. And then I see a man holding one of the horses, reins. And I said to myself, what on earth is he doing there? And it dawned on me afterwards that they never took it out. He was one of the, the staff holding the horse so it wouldn't run away. But he was left in the picture, you know, well... The film that had the biggest influence was Shane. Uh, it starred uh, Alan Ladd, um, who I believe was quite small. He looked huge to us, but I believe he stood on a box, somebody told me, uh, for certain scenes. Uh, and Jack Palance, I think, as a young actor, appeared in that, and Van Heflin appeared in it. That was a, a wonderful Western. Uh, at the time, it was dubbed as the greatest Western ever made. I don't know why I remember that, but I do. I was fairly good at the whistling, like, you know. I wonder if I was going anywhere, like, walking. I shut off. Uh, what was the name of the... of the... that went with the picture, the song, uh, The Call of the Faraway Hills. That was it. 
I had a key and I opened the door on my own house outside and I came in. And my mother, she was darling some stockings or something. And she says, oh, Tim, she said, when I had the call of the Faraway Hills, I said, you weren't long behind. <laughs> you know, but uh, not a mess in her soul. She was a lovely person. And, of course, the wise boy is beside us would be saying, look behind you, he's coming, watch out, and then they'd be banging, it would nearly vibrate in the seats. And, like, they used to be bang, bang, and shooting and jumping, and it, but, and they couldn't read. And if the cinema went, if the film went wrong, and it would stop, they, couldn't, they thought the film was over, you know, that kind of thing, you know? And when the film was over, we'd ride our horses down the main street, whipping our behinds with sticks to make us go faster and live on the memories for the rest of the week until next Sunday. My aunt went uptown one day when she came back, there were two doors missing in the house. <laughs> and the boys in those days used to make rafts, you know. So they were watching um, Huckleberry Finn. They were watching Huckleberry Finn. So the boys made a raft out of the two doors. <laughs> and they were seen going out the harbour. Dumbo Parks was on a megaphone saying, we'll get help you soon. <laughs> The boys were happy out. One that stands out for me was um, Hans Christian Andersen with Danny Kay and Farley Granger, was it? Oh, and the music and that, and the little duckling and the emperor's new clothes, and oh, it was absolutely brilliant. The music was beautiful in it, and we were all stunned at that. Another film that stands out in my mind uh, would be... Um Mario Lanza, you know, and the student prince. And My brother was a very keen Mario Lanza fan, very keen, and joined the Mario Lanza Appreciation Society and went to America to meet up with the family and became friendly with the family. And about uh, seven or eight years ago, I was in Los Angeles with my brother and Mario Lanza's son, Damon, uh, invited us to his house for dinner. And we went there, a beautiful house in Palos Verde, overlooking the Pacific, very nice. And he brought out some of the, uh, the dress, the, the uh, costumes that Mario Lanza wore in The Great Crusoe. And my brother and his friend, who's also a Mario Lanza fan, fitted them on. I didn't participate, but I remember thinking, going back, little did I think that uh, seeing Mario Lanza in the courtship village hall, that I would wind up meeting his son in in California. You know, it was very important to, to people growing up and it opened up a whole world of, of glamour and romance and, you know, something exciting that was happening somewhere in the world. I had arranged to meet with a fella and, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't just go yourself. I would have all of my friends and he would have all of his friends and they would come and see the film. But the whole point of it was that I was meeting him. Now, I didn't talk to him at all, but I think he'd specifically arranged to go and see a horror film. Um, I think it was Alien versus Predator. Um, in the hopes that that would, I don't know, make me seek comfort in him or something. I don't know. It went in fashion and wavelengths. Uh, it definitely was the Hammer Horror type movies. Egypt, 4,000 years ago. A land of strange rituals and savage cruelty. Many of their secrets are still hidden from the eyes of 20th century man. Secrets that protect their dead. Supernatural powers that once released can live again in our modern world. It was frightening and I don't know how you'd get away with it. And to this day, I cannot watch. Um, the mummy. So I would have been four years of age at the time. So I don't. I know I wasn't more than six. You know, in case it came to us later. But I'll never forget it. Myself and my younger brother going to see this. I remember seeing a horror film about an artist who had his hand cut off, and the hand crawled along the road, and it came up on a, a rainy night up on the windscreen. And I watched the film. I went home and I couldn't sleep in my own bed. And I'd say for about three weeks, my parents brought down a camp bed from the attic 
set it up in their bedroom and I couldn't even sleep on the camp bed. I had to sleep in between the two of them. I could picture the hand coming up the duvet, you know, to come and strangle me. It was horrendous. The other one, and it comes on par with it, is um, The Horror of Dracula. And that was like Peter Cushing, I think it was, and Christopher Lee. And we were so frightened about vampires that when we came out, we were looking in the road for sticks, you know, the lollipop sticks, to make crosses. And we did, we made crosses and we, would, we stayed in the bed together after we saw that film. And we had got string to tie up the crosses and we kept the crosses with us and we couldn't sleep that night after we'd seen it. I still remember it. <laughs> I remember Jaws and everyone was terrified about going swimming afterwards in the old beach and you were just praying a shark would come, you know. It's just, why can't we have a shark like they have in Jaws? Um, the films in the 70s, I just, I just I, 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 even today, I still can't believe how rich they were in terms of cinema. Um, I saw films like The Godfather, The Deer Hunter, The Shining, um, The Apocalypse Now, uh, The Exorcist. <laughs> It came up, uh, maybe we could go to the movies, The Exorcist, and, and my mother said, well, you know, what, what age is that? And the cousin said, oh, I, I've seen that. And I was around, okay, I was older than him, I was maybe 17. And that was like, there was so much wrote about that, and I remember reading in the Sunday papers, you know what I mean? Don't go to see it, there was all sorts of peripheral type of things that may have happened around it and like that, and uh, I didn't. You know, you wouldn't, well, you were afraid to, really, you know. Something beyond comprehension is happening to a little girl on this street, in this house. A man has been sent for, as a last resort, to try and save her. <laughs> We decided to go along, and my my 15 year old brother came along as well, right? And and we go upstairs, and you know we get to the the rotating head pea soup puke scene. And, I mean, the blood has gone from my face now at this stage, right? And all of a sudden, there is this drunk behind me who starts roaring, laughing. And it was the only thing that saved me from running out of the cinema and having nightmares for weeks. My partner knew my fear of the mummy because I always said to him, it really affected, it, it really, really affected me, you know, at the age I was. And he bought the home, home, the 1979 version one day, and I was screaming at him, said, do not show it to me. He said, look, just watch, just watch. He wasn't telling me anymore, just watch. I can't, I can't. And I was putting newspapers over my head and everything. He said, please, just watch, just watch. And after about 10 minutes, I realised it's a spoof. <laughs> so it just broke. It just broke then the whole thing of the other one, you know. My brother took me to Lord of the Rings. He's 12 years older than I am. It was the Return of the King, so the third one, and I think I was about three or four at the time. Um, and we went, and he actually had to take me out of the cinema because I was crying, because I was uh, making a lot of noise, because there's one scene in it where the, the, the kind of the good, good guys win in the end kind of thing, and all the orcs get beaten. And I really, really was really, I got really upset about it, so. You like the orcs? Oh, I've always been, I always think the bad guys are just a lot more interesting, a lot more engaging, and I don't know, I've just always preferred, I always kind of a little bit secretly want the bad guys to win a lot of the time, so. When we were very good in the orphanage, on um, around Christmas or Easter, depending on how good the collective group were, we, they brought in a black and white movie to the um, refectory and they changed the eating dining room into oh, dining room. They changed the eating room into um, a cinema and we all sat there watching movies. My oldest memory of movies, which of course to us was a complete joy, was black and white. You're, you're talking about um, what's Charlie Chaplin? What's that guy who used to climb up the wall? Lloyd. Hard loyal, um, they were Buster Keating. That's what they had because they were safe, and nuns had to were not allowed to show you anything else but things that were safe. And as we went on to the and to us, so you can understand my love of cinema, 
that to me was the greatest treat. We looked forward to it. Each Christmas or Easter, we looked forward to this one treat, and that was to watch a movie. And then they sort of advanced a bit, and we got to see more uh, feature. I think we had the singing nun. They were always controlled very strictly, <laughs> censored-wise, but to us, they were a complete getaway. They were a complete joy. When I was at boarding school, we had a film night once a month, but the film was the Jesuit, Jesuit priest's choice, so it wasn't really of general interest to the school population, but you, 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 you were forced to attend. The holy movie was what it says. It was a holy movie, so we were going to... Um, it, to, it was like, um, you know, going to Mass or going to Confession or going to the Holy Movie. It was part of the, the, the Trinity. <laughs> you marched in, you sat down, you watched, you were quiet, and then you marched out, and, you know, and you spoke about it to your friends afterwards. The, 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 the pleasant or unpleasant experience about it was that I was very short-sighted. I had no glasses. I wasn't diagnosed with short-sightedness or anything like that throughout my whole primary education. So looking at the blackboard was a blur. And here I was now going to see this holy movie and the whole screen was just a blur to me as well. Um, the parish priest, Father Daly, got this um, projector and the little um, projector house, we call it, built. Um, and we uh, were going more or less, I'd say, once a week or something. Sometime, it must be probably in the late 50s, early 60s, I'm not sure. But it was mostly Norman Wisdom films, and I think Scotland Yard bits, that's my memory anyway. But Norman Wisdom was a definite. Because the young nuns were there as well as us, every time any two sort of even came together to speak nearly, that there might be a hug or a kiss or whatever, the shutter went down. And it really was so funny because she usually uh, put it down too late or put it back up too early. Or... Uh, looking back, I often wondered, you know, how uh, the Christian brothers even allowed us to go to the cinema to see even uh, like a holy movie. The nuns in Bantry, where my sister went to school, they were selective about some movies that the, their girls could go to see. And one time my sister went to see the Trap family with, with uh, the whole group of girls from her class at school. And they were allowed to take their brothers or sisters with them if they wanted to. So I went with my sister. And this was a special showing on a midday afternoon. And I think for me, I didn't see so much of the movie because it was my first time really discovering that other girls existed besides my sister. And I was distracted by them inside in the theater. The Reverend Mother rang me and said, Charlie, my girls are going down to see Agony and the Ecstasy today. I read a book, it's a beautiful book, she said, but there was one scene in it, I believe, in a brothel and a few ladies in a state of undress. Oh, yes, Reverend Mother, I said, that won't be in it this afternoon. So I went down to the cinema with one, with one of the lads and we got out the, uh, the, the roll of film, or the reel of film, which was on, and we just got that bit, snip, snip. It wasn't a designated cinema, it was a dance hall that showed movies twice a week. And it was one and six for adults and nine pence for children. It had a huge influence on me, it was there from the mid 50s until 1961 when the hall burned down. There was a man, I think his name was Dennehy, and he was going around mid Cork and show films. Uh, in places like Blarney and Coachford and Crookstown and places like that. But Friday night was the night for Coachford. Apparently, he was informed that the first thing he had to do was to contact the parish priest to get, to get the OK. The priest was hesitant enough, so he said, and what, now tell me about the movies now you'll be showing. He said, the first movie we'll show now is The Song of Bernadette. He was, the priest was so convinced, Canon Murphy was so convinced that on the Sunday morning, he, on the altar, he announced to everybody that this beautiful film was going to be shown on Sunday night. Um, lovely musical about a saint. So what more can you do? Everybody should go and see it. Because basically all that was done is he put up a screen 
uh, this, the, the, the seating was arranged, uh, benches uh, for the front, and there was a little, some seats in the back, but there was no cinema aspect to it as such. So, but there was always a sense of occasion. On the examiner, there was another cinema, the Nachtnagree Radiant Cinema. And he obviously showed f films there as well because they always had the same film as we had. So you could look at the paper and you might see Nachtnagree Radiant Cinema playing Saturday night or whatever. Well, we knew that's the one we were going to have Sunday night. There was a, a makeshift cinema set up in uh, Drumcolour, which would be in the Cork Limerick border. And a man from Kentucky cycled there. I'm quite sure he cycled, or the people cycled as well. But in 1926, there was a huge fire there. And it was a makeshift cinema that was set up over a hardware store. And he was working for some film company in Cork. And he had some connection with the local taxi driver. So he got a loan of the reel, a loan now in inverted commas, of the reels and brought them down. And word got out that there was a film being shown in drum colour. But of course, everyone had to go to Benediction first. So it wasn't set up till the quarter past nine at night. It was September and they got a generator and they had lights. But to show the, the reel of film, he got a candle. But the candle fell on top of the reels and they ignited straight away. And of course, because it was over a hardware shop, there was oil and paraffin and everything. And the whole place became an inferno. And 48 people, men, women and children, lost their lives that night in Drumcolour to see a film. And the only the whole thing was the film was the Ten Commandments. Like they went to benediction first and then they went to an extension of a benediction to watch a film. But it was just the excitement of it. It was something new. Uh, but the, somebody would cycle from our town to Drumcolor. And one man did, Mr. Foley, my father always spoke about it. Connie Foley was there on the night of Drumcolor burning and he survived it, to tell the tale. In my life that time, way back in, in um, the late 40s, about 46, 47, 48, would have been the travelling shows coming. They'd come with plays and so on. There were the fit-ups, is what you'd call them. But what I used to like most of all was the, um, <clears throat> the travelling cinemas. And they used to come to the hall. And the one crowd that used to come actually was Duffy's. They used to arrive in Belnascarty and they, 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 they had these, I suppose you'd call them kind of a wagon or a carriage, but they, they had their own generators and so on for to, for to get the projectors going. And they'd pull up close to the hall and they would um, show the film through the window at that end of the hall. And of course, to project it right on to the other end of the hall. It wasn't, the hall wasn't that, that big or that long. And uh, it was a sheet, an ordinary sheet, and the film would be shown on. No, there wasn't a cinema here, but when I was in primary school for, it must have been two years, there did, at some, some stage, it must have been in probably fifth class, I'd say, there was, or sixth class even, there was a mobile cinema came. And watching a film that you'd be used to seeing in the cinema in a truck, and then when you're in the truck not being aware that the truck is there at all, um, is a pretty cool concept. It wouldn't be there all the time, it might be there, you know, every couple of weeks or there'd be long stretches of time where it wouldn't be there and it might be there for a couple of days and it would show movies and stuff like that and that was like super exciting because it used to park literally right outside my primary school in school. But it was long, really quite thin and there was one small row down the middle of the truck and then there was maybe two or three seats on either side and then the whole length of the truck then. Yeah, but it was fully kitted out. I don't think there was any, I don't think they sold any food or anything like that. I think people used to just bring that in themselves. But yeah, I really, I remember really enjoying that as well. I remember it being full whenever it was, whenever, but I also remember the town being very busy whenever it was around. Oh, there was always something going on. I'll always remember they came one time and there was a, a tear in the sheet, a big tear, a big tear in the sheet. And my mother had this, the singer sewing machine, of course, which was in most houses at the time, so she repaired the sheet. And it went up, but you could see the line. But <clears throat> there was a bank robbery in the Western film. And the outlaws were making a dash for it over into the Mexican border. 
<laughs> and it so happened the Mexican border was where the, the sheet had been repaired. <laughs> and we just got it, Mrs. Cannon's Mexican border going. <laughs> My parents, they used to rent a house in Yall in the early to mid-50s. And one of the years, they filmed Moby Dick. And every evening, or every chance I was getting, I was going to see uh, Moby Dick, the, the filming. I was only six years of age, but this particular area around here, the excitement was unbelievable. I was fortunate in, in as much as that. I was born in the clock eight in Yall. And uh, I had a bird's eye view from the top, looking down onto the film being actually made. And uh, it was fascinating. One was the opening scene in Moby Dick. It was, um, it was in New England and there was a storm and the wind was blowing. And there was, the, I think it was a fellow called Leo Gen, not sure. But all he had to do was put his scarf around and shiver and walk into the door of a pub in New England, but uh, in reality, it was a beautiful summer's evening. There was a wind machine, and the all fire brigade provided the rain. Uh. The two cinemas here since the early 1900s, I think around 1914, 15, 16, there was actually two cinemas on the main street, which is, you know, extraordinary for a, a small town. The Horgan Cinema was run by the Horgan family. They were the original filmmakers uh, here in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. The Regal Cinema was run by the Hearst family. So I think everybody who grew up in you all, you know, from that period on had great uh, affection for cinema and going to the cinema and it had a massive influence on culture here I think. It was a wonderful time in, 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 in Yall and it's only like when you lose something like that that you realise it you know. Well, I think one of my first memories was going with my father, and I must have been only about three or four, and I think Ben Hur was on. So my father didn't want to miss Ben Hur. So we actually went up to the back of the cinema. You know, it was, is this our cinema, um, you showed this, the film from the back. It was a rear-facing screen, which is, I think, pretty unusual. So, so you could go up behind the screen, and there was a little ledge which you walked along, and there were two seats here, so you, on the floor and you couldn't go out too far because otherwise you'd come out, your shadow would come out on the screen. So my earliest memory is of sitting on the little seat and my father had to go some, some there was a problem with the, um, Mikey had a problem with showing the film, some problems, so he had to leave me. So all these big chariots were coming towards me. <laughs> it was really scary. You could see the screen, everything was shown backwards. So all the writing and everything was backwards when you were, when you were sitting here. So that's where my father always watched the films. I was running the local cinema here from about 1964 till when it closed in 1981. That was the cinema in its last location, which was in Townsend Street, which is now the Ludgate Centre. Uh, that opened, and that cinema opened in 1942. Quite funny, when I took it over, somebody had painted the screen, and as you know, the sound system was behind the screen, and was, there were perforations in the screen for the sound to come through for somebody to save a bit of money because the screen that got a bit from smoke and cigarette smoke, etc., had got a bit uh, dull. So they painted the screen and forgot the, the holes were still there. So when, one of the first jobs we had, when, with the lads, the young fellow, if you were lads with me, we got up and we got little pins and we were pinning out the paint out of the holes so the sound would come through. That was one of the first, uh, first jobs we had. And then when we got it, when we made it, when we got a few bob together, from, it was very successful for a while. We bought a new screen. The essential parts of the projector are a pre-focused light source, easily replaced. An optical system consisting of condensers, adjustable reflector, and a quick-focus lens, readily removed for cleaning. 
midway through a reel of film, you know, my track, and you'd hear the sound coming up from below. They'd be all roaring and shouting, oh, the bloody projectionist again. <laughs> but it couldn't be our fault at all. We used to have, to have cement to join them, you know, and it was a tedious old job. So we came up with an idea, we used sellotape. It used to work great, and it, we used to notice that when we'd get films coming back from other cinemas, to be joined by sedatives, so they all kind of copped onto that eventually too. So. When we closed this place, I remember it well, it was like a death in the family. That's how we felt about it, you know? My name is Mike Laurie Elden, and I originally bought the cinema about 37, 38 years ago. I bought it at the time more as an investment as having an interest in film. Um, an interest in film developed, we'll say, over the following years, and we successfully ran this place for 35 years. So there'd be loads of us going in there. It was great memories, it was a great place. We, lo we all loved it. It was such innocent fun. I remember of a Sunday, Sunday evening, to be packed in the summertime. They'd be coming in in bicycles from all over. Because the cinema here was the only one around, like, outside Charleville and Mallow and dim things. Everybody from town came here. It was the kind of, it was the only entertainment we had in Kentuck, as such, you know? Seven nights a week in four lectures. Two Matthews on Saturday and Sunday. It was absolutely packed. Outside now in my house, there'd be a line of people up along the street. Up a Sunday night, like. But it was sad to see Seiko, do you know? As the years went on, it got harder and harder because of folly attendances. And in the end of the day, they stopped making 35 mil film. And they went digital and the cost of, that, that's what really puts us out of business. It wasn't easy coming in, coming in here, and it hasn't been easy coming in here since. <laughs> 